In this video we're going to talk about fitting models other than straight lines to data. This data can clearly be described by a smooth function, just not a linear one. What should we do to fit a model to these observations? There are several ways to deal with nonlinearity. The three we'll talk about here are transformation, segmentation, and nonlinear fitting. If the data is described by a relationship y is equal to f of x, then plotting the inverse function of f applied to y as a function of x will give a straight line. To make this clear, let's say the functional relationship is y is equal to x squared plus 1. Then plotting square root of y minus 1 against x will yield a straight line. Pause, go get a piece of paper and make sure this makes sense. In other scenarios, it might be necessary to transform the independent variable or both variables. For example, if the data is described by a power law, y is equal to a times x to the power of b, then taking logs of both sides gives log y is equal to a times log x plus c, so that plotting the logarithm of y against the logarithm of x yields a straight line. A data set may be described by not one, but multiple linear relationships. For example, we might have two classes of objects plotted on the same axis, both obeying different linear relationships, or we might have a breakpoint or threshold where the system obeys a linear relationship until a certain value of the independent variable is reached, then it switches into a regime characterized by a linear relationship but with different parameters. This is often the case when measuring material properties, for example, something like a stress-strain relationship. The plot here is an example of a segmented regression for the amount of mustard seed produced versus soil salinity, though the fit shown here, which is Wikipedia's example, is not completely convincing if you ask me. In practice, modern packages which do regression, like SciPy, are capable of fitting almost any function you care to construct. For example, the function curvefit will accept any complex function you give it and attempt to fit it to your data. The curvefit function accepts a number of parameters which we should discuss. We have to provide a user-defined function as well as the x and y data. We can also provide p0, an initial guess for the parameters, as well as the bounds parameter to specify the maximum and minimum allowed parameter values. If we have a complicated, multi-parameter, non-linear function, we can sometimes find that minimizing the errors of the data can give inconsistent or nonsensical results. Though we won't get into optimization on this course, if we know roughly the value of some of the parameters, we can improve the speed and accuracy of the algorithm by passing in an initial guess. Likewise, if we know that some parameter values are not allowed because they would correspond to impossible situations like say negative weight or height over 10 feet, we can restrict the allowed range to reflect this. Another interesting parameter is sigma. We can use this to reflect uncertainty in the values of y. This is achieved by defining the residuals and minimizing the sum of the squared residuals divided by the sigma values. If there is a large uncertainty in the value of y, it contributes less to the sum, which makes sense. If a data point is very uncertain, we shouldn't worry about making the line go close to it. We should focus on data points which we know are accurate. Curvefit returns two arrays. Popt are the optimized values of the parameters, and Pcov is the estimated covariance matrix of the parameters. We mentioned covariance briefly in a previous lecture. It is a way to compare how deviations in one variable, x, relate to deviations in another, y. The cross terms are interesting, but here we're only interested in the case where x is equal to y, and in that case covariance is equal to variance. Going back to curve fit, to get error estimates we use the diagonal elements of the covariance matrix to get the estimated variance of the parameters and take their square roots to get the error estimate. We should always estimate errors on our fit parameters, and we'll talk about a number of ways to do this in the next video. One final point, the method used behind the scenes by curve fit to find the best parameters comes from the same equations we discussed for linear least squares, minimizing the sum of the squared residuals. This time, the differential equation cannot be solved analytically, so the parameter values are changed by a small amount and the corresponding change in the sum of squared errors is measured. Using Taylor's theorem, we can approximate this change in terms of the matrix of the first derivatives of f, also known as the Jacobian J. Substituting this into the sum of squared residuals gives a matrix equation, and these matrix equations can be solved by standard algorithms in linear algebra. The standard method for unconstrained problems is called the Levenberg Marquardt algorithm. We don't need to worry about the details of this algorithm, however, we should note that the Jack parameter allows us to pass an array of functions which compute the Jacobian of f. If we don't do this, the Jacobian is estimated numerically, which can be unstable in some situations. Generally, for reasonably well behaved data, as we'll be encountering in these lectures, we won't need to do this, but it's something to keep in mind if your fits are failing or giving nonsensical results. Curve fitting algorithms, in whatever other language you might end up using, are all based on the same principles covered here, even if the notation is different, so these ideas apply generally.